Ephesians chapter four, verse 27 says, do not give the devil a foothold in your life. Do not give the devil a foothold. But what is a foothold? And how do we give him a foothold in our lives? And if it's something that we're not supposed to do, why are we doing it, right? And I think that sometimes it's because we don't know what, the, what a foothold is and how we've given the enemy a part of our lives. So that is what we're going to talk about in today's video. So grab your Bible and your journal because you'll want to take notes. I'm going to define for you what a foothold is by giving a very good illustration that I think you'll be able to relate to. And then we're gonna talk about the top three ways we give the enemy a foothold in our lives and not even aware of it. And then finally, I'm gonna give you a solution. Yes, I believe that there is a solution to all of our situations in the scriptures. So let's get ready. Get your Bible and your journal and let's get started. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Natalie Brown Rudd, the founder of Because of His Grace Ministries. And my role is to give you the tools that you need in order to develop a lifestyle of faith and grow closer in your relationship with the Most High. If you are ready to go to the next level of understanding and revelation, this is the station for you. So subscribe to our YouTube station and be prepared to receive content that will help you to grow in your understanding and your relationship with the Most High. So now this video is about a foothold. What in the heck is it? How do we give the enemy a foothold in our life? And why is this even important? And so it's important because it's in the scriptures. Ephesians chapter four, verse 27 says, don't do this. So there is a reason why our father, the most high Yahweh, Yahuwah told us not to do this because he understood that once we give the enemy a foothold in our lives, we can no longer be victorious. We'll actually be defeated by the enemy that Yahshua, Yahusha died for us to be victorious over. So I want us to understand what a foothold is and how we are giving the enemy this inch into our lives. And to best de describe or define a foothold, I want to share an illustration that I found on ChristianPost.com. ChristianPost.com, there was an article entitled Three Ways Christians Give the Devil a Foothold in Their Lives. And this is from 2017. And I believe that the illustration that this author shares is spot on and will help us to visually understand what a foothold is. Because sometimes there are things in the Bible that they're written there, but we don't necessarily understand it. And the best way to explain it is through an illustration. So the author says a foothold can be best understood by imagining yourself being chased by a bad person. You run up to your room and you try to close the door, but the person sticks his shoe at the bottom end of the door so you can't close it. That part of his foot that prevents you from closing the door effectively is called a foothold. Perfect example. So you're running from a bad person, you run into your room, you try to close the door, but you can't close the door because the person who's chasing you has put his foot in the door and it won't close. That is a foothold. And that is what we do with the enemy. We allow him to get an inch into our lives, sometimes completely unaware. And all he needs is that little entrance in in order to influence your decisions, in order to influence your mindset. And remember, the enemy's role is to kill, steal, and destroy. So if you give him an inch or you give him a foothold into your life, he's going to kill your dreams, he's going to kill your faith, he's going to steal your joy, and he's going to destroy your destiny. That's his role. And he is doing his job and he's never, ever not doing his job. So you as a believer, you as a daughter of the most high, you have to understand what a foothold is, understand how you allow the enemy into your life. And that's what I want to talk about now. The top three ways that we allow the enemy into our lives. And again, sometimes we're not even aware of it. For one, if we read the scripture, 
Ephesians chapter four, verse 27, but we didn't understand what a foothold is right there. The enemy has a foothold because we don't know what it is. And if we don't know what it is, we definitely can't recognize it in our lives in order to stop doing those things, right? So he has a foothold, but we don't know how he got in because we don't know what a foothold is. We're already defeated. That's why it's important. So now I wanna turn to the top three ways that we give the enemy a foothold in our life. So we're going to talk about the top three ways that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives now that we understand the illustration. And I'm going to start with the number three reason and go work it down to the number one reason. So the number three, the third way, the number three way that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives is through un forgiveness, unforgiveness. Now, to make this really easy to remember these three ways, they all begin with the prefix un, unforgiveness. So unforgiveness is the number three way that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives. And why is this important to understand? Because the enemy breeds off of unforgiveness. He, he, gets a foothold in your life, he gets influence over you when you do not extend forgiveness for whatever reason. Not to say that you aren't justified for being angry, not to say that you're not justified for how you feel, but because you're holding on to unforgiveness, the enemy now gets a, a way over you. He now has a way to control you. He has now has a way to influence and attack you. And remember, it's to kill, steal, and destroy. And so the scripture talks about, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not hold on to unforgiveness. Forgive as you also need to be forgiven. Now, this is not to minimize any pain or hurt that you are experiencing, but unforgiveness is a way that the enemy comes into your life. Now, there are three ways or three areas that we can hold on to unforgiveness. One of them is through un met needs, unmet needs. And this is from the work of Liberty Savard and breaking the strongholds in your life. She talks about unmet needs and unmet needs are those things that should have happened. And I'm just gonna write should have. They should have happened in your life because you need them. It's a something, it's a core need, like the need to be accepted, the need to be cared for, uh, the need to be have security, the need for love and, and being um, cared for. Those are basic needs that we all have that everyone should have. But somehow in our lives, the things that should have happened did not happen. For example, your parents should have loved you. Uh, you should have had a secure home. You should have felt cared for and not abandoned. Uh, you should have felt loved and accepted. Again, core needs that we all have as human beings, but for some reason that didn't happen in your life. So there's this area of unmet needs that the enemy takes advantage of and it breeds anger. It breeds resentment and bitterness, which is the which is the part of unforgiveness. And we hold on to that and the enemy comes in our lives. So that loved one that should have been there for you that wasn't, or that basic need of acceptance and, and security, you should have had it, but for some reason you did not. That is a way the enemy comes in and he just puts a knife through that wound. Another area of unforgiveness is unhealed hurts, unhealed hurts. And these are things, ooh, drop my pen. These are things that should not have happened, but they did and they left a wound in your life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about that trauma that you experienced. I'm talking about that heartache that happened. I'm talking about where that parent shouldn't have left you, but they did. 
I'm talking about that spouse that walked out on you or the spouse that abused you or that trauma, maybe it was a rape or, or something was stolen for you or something was taken from you. Those are things that should not have happened in your life, but they did. And they leave a wound. They leave a feeling of anger and again, unforgiveness that the enemy uses against you. Those things shouldn't have happened. And he makes certain that you never forget that they did. And so that is a way that he gets a foothold in your life through unforgiveness. And the third way, which is really a little tricky, are unfulfilled desires. Unfulfilled desires. And how does that connect with forgiveness? It's connected to forgiveness because sometimes these empty places in our lives leave a void. And that void is then filled with regret, resentment, anger, that, oh, I desire to have a spouse, but I don't have a spouse. So I'm angry and I am upset and I feel like I'm missing out on something. Or it's that job that I desire. I want that job and that title and that salary. But for some reason, I keep getting overlooked for a promotion. I had this desire, but it's not being fulfilled. I pray to the father over and over again, but he is not hearing me. And now I'm angry at somebody and worse, I'm angry at the father, right? So I'm, I'm anger is connected to forgiveness. We have to understand that. So if I'm angry at you and I think you're withholding something from me, I'm not going to forgive you until I get that thing, right? And so these are three areas that breed unforgiveness that give the enemy an inch into our lives. We're trying to close the door but he keeps sticking his foot in. So he gets a foothold through unmet needs, unhealed hurts, and unfulfilled desires, all related to I'm angry and I'm gonna hold on to that and I'm not gonna forgive whoever it is, if it's another human being or if it's our father. And the enemy loves for you to hold on to unforgiveness. So the second area that the enemy gets a foothold in our lives, number two, is through unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. Now, this is really important because sin puts a block between you and the father. It can become a stronghold where you can't get to the father. Your prayers aren't being answered because you are what? Practicing sin. And the Bible says that those who practice sin will not enter into the kingdom. And you may be saying, but Natalie, we all sin and fall short of the glory. I'm always going to be a sinner. You're right. You're absolutely right that it's scripture, that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God and that we are all sinners. But even though I am a sinner, does not mean that I practice sinning. Hmm? There's a difference between sinning and being a sinner and practicing sin. Hear me out. Practicing sin means I know it's wrong, but I choose to do it over and over and over again. And I go to God and I ask for forgiveness and I expect to receive his grace because he knows my heart and he knows how hard I struggle and he knows that I'm just human. So I'm going to do this sin and ask for forgiveness because he's gracious and he's loving and he's going to forgive me. That is practicing sin and it's taking advantage of the most high's grace. Now, he says in Philippians chapter four that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So we do not have to be in bondage to sin because Philippians four says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I can't be in bondage to sin and believe Philippians chapter four because they contradict each other. It is possible to be a sinner and not practice sin, not practice the same sin over and over again, but instead, Second Chronicles talks about turning away. So you practice Second Chronicles where it says Second Chronicles. Oh, what is that scripture? Second Chronicles. 
scripture is 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I say it all the time, but I totally went blank on it. And it says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and I will heal their land. So it is clear, and this is just one scripture on sin. There are a hundred other ones on sin that if we turn from our wicked ways and we confess our sin and turn back to the father he will forgive us but when we hold on to our sin and we make it a practice we're giving the enemy a foothold in our lives so my friend if you believe that there is a sin that is overpowering you that there is a sin that you just can't let go of that's the enemy's foothold in your life that is a prime example. Now, you can let go of that sin. You can turn away and kick the enemy out. And we're going to talk about that because I'm going to give you the solution. But you can kick the enemy out. That's why the scripture says that if you practice sin, you won't enter heaven. But those who turn away from their sin, you will receive the reward of everlasting salvation. You will receive the reward. You will be delivered from the enemy's hand, but you first have to understand that it's possible. So that unconfessed sin, if you're holding on to something, if you're harboring sin in your heart and you believe that you can't let it go, that's an example of the foothold that the enemy has on you. And the scripture says, do not give it to him. So what do we have to do? We have to confess our sin. Second Chronicles 7, 14, we have to confess and turn back. And so if this is an issue for you, look up the scriptures on sin, look them up, write up, write them out and make them a prayer that you want to be free, set free of the bondage of whatever that sin is, because it does not have to have a hold on you. Yahshua, your savior, Yahshua, our Christ, he died for us to be victorious. He died for us so that we would not live in bondage to the enemy. So that is the second area that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives. I want you to pause, look at your notes and understand how you give the enemy a foothold. Does any of this resonate with you? Is there anything that you need to pray about so that you can kick the enemy out of your life and be obedient to Ephesians chapter four, verse 27. So we've talked about the two areas that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives. Now I wanna talk about the number one way that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives that we don't even understand or realize. And the reason I say that is because it's not something that's talked about. It's not something that I even learned except for the last four or five years. And it is so very important for us to know if we're going to be victorious in this life. And because we don't talk about it, we're not aware of it. And because we're not aware of it, the enemy has a foothold, not only in our lives, but in generation after generation after generation. This is how he maintains his control over Yah's people. And so it's very important for us to understand it. And I'm going to spend some time breaking it down because it may be something that you have not heard of. And it's important for you to learn it so that you can break the foothold and kick the enemy out and be victorious in your walk with the most high, which by the way, is your life. <laughs> and I need to really explain that because sometimes we think about our spiritual growth only being uh, impactful in the spiritual things of life. But you do understand that the most high wants to be Lord of your life. He wants every area of your life. So your mental health, your relationships, your physical health, your finances, your dreams, your aspirations, your career, how you handle different circumstances, the ups and downs of life. He wants to be Lord of it all. So this is not just about one little piece of the pie. This is about the whole pie, <laughs> right? He is the reason why we live, move, and have our very being. We're only alive because we have a spirit. 
We have his breath of life. So he wants to be Lord of it all. So that's why it's important to seek him first, his kingdom and his righteousness, then everything else will fall into place. That's really why this is important. Okay, I just needed to say that to you so that you can connect the dots as to why this is important for your life. Okay, the number one way that we give the enemy a foothold in our lives is through unrighteous agreements. And I'm also going to put down covenants. Unrighteous covenants. And before I forget, it's Joshua chapter nine and second Samuel 21. Those are the two scriptures that I'm not going to read for sake of time of this video, but that I want you to, to reference in your Bible. I want you to read in your study time, Joshua chapter nine and second Samuel 21, because this unrighteous agreements or covenants is so important for you to get, because that is the way that the most high operates. He operates through agreements and covenants. And it talks about it throughout the entire Bible. It is about the most high being in covenant with a particular group of people. He says, out of all the nations in the world, I chose you to be in covenant. And he doesn't do anything without a covenant being in place. And it's shown throughout the entire Bible. The covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Moses, the covenant with Joshua, the covenant with the Israelites and David, the covenant that he made with these group of people and it plays out in the Bible. In fact, that is the overall narrative of the Bible. It's about covenants. And because the Most High goes into an agreement with you, he says, I am going to be your God and you are going to be my people. And if I am for you, then who can be against you? right? Because you're in covenant with me. You're my set apart people. And I give you a certain way to live. I give you instructions to follow because I want you to be the light of the world. I want you to be the salt of the earth. I want you to be the example that shows other people how to get back to the father. That is your role because you're in covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the only reason that Yahshua showed up is because of this covenant. And the covenant was broken. And because the covenant was broken, Yahshua had to come and save the people and get them in right standing with the Father. Now, why is this important? And what in the world does it have to do with footholds? It has everything to do with the enemy getting a foothold in your life because the enemy mimics the most high. Remember, he wanted to be the most high. His pride overtook him and he wanted to be in the place of the Lord. He wanted to be praised. He wanted to be worshiped. And so he got kicked out of heaven because he had this aspiration to be God. And the most high is like, I don't share my glory with anyone. You are a created being, so you got to go. But the enemy's role is to mimic the most high and to deceive the people so that he can pull them on his side. That's why he wants a foothold in your life. So if the most high operates in covenants, best believe the enemy mimics it as well. And he has covenants that he makes with you, that he makes with your ancestors, that he makes with generations after generations. And these covenants operate behind the scenes in our lives. They operate in our lives and they rinse and repeat unless we break them. If we break the covenant, then the cycle stops. Now, this is really important because if you don't understand that there's a covenant that you've made or that your ancestors have made or that some family member has made with the enemy, you won't be able to be victorious because the covenant will continue to work. And the reason it's important 
is because the most high honors covenants. It's how he operates. And he honors the covenant, whether it is good or whether it is evil. Remember, he says, I am the creator of good and evil. I am the creator of prosperity and calamity. I am the one that gives life and takes away life. You have to understand what sovereign means. He's in control of it all, but he honors covenants because he's faithful to his word and covenants is how he operates. And the reason I gave you Joshua chapter nine and second Samuel 21 is because it is a great biblical example of what I'm trying to teach you. Joshua chapter nine, Joshua made a covenant that was not righteous. He made an evil covenant because he was deceived by the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter nine. He did not seek the most high. He did not seek his counsel, but he went into covenant with a group of people, the Gibeonites who deceived him. And even though it was an unrighteous covenant, the most high honored it. And we see the ramifications of this covenant being played out after Joshua's already gone. It's played out in the lives of the Israelites as they're going from nation to nation. It's played out in Saul when Saul was the king of the Israelites. And we see the negative consequences of this evil covenant, this unrighteous covenant that Joshua made in chapter Joshua chapter nine. And we see the ramifications of it in 2 Samuel 21. I may have lost you, but that's why you can pause and write it down, study the scriptures for yourself, because this is important for you. I need you to get it. I love you so much that I really want to spend this time so that you get that there are unrighteous agreements and covenants operating in the back or un uh, behind the scenes in your lives that's playing out that gives the enemy a foothold. And when the enemy has a foothold, his plan is to what? To kill, steal, and destroy. And the one way that he kills, steals, and destroy is to deceive you. That you don't even know what's happening in your life. Because if you knew, you would break the covenant. And if you knew, you'd kick him out. And he wouldn't have a foothold over you. He wouldn't have that stronghold over you. So get in the scriptures because it's telling you the details of your lives. And it's also going to tell you how to overcome the enemy, how to kick him out and make certain that you close the door, seal it shut so that he does not have a foothold in your life. Are you getting me? Are you following what I'm saying? so important that you understand this because if you're not aware of it then you just keep repeating the cycle over and over again so in summary the three ways the enemy gets a foothold in your life number one is through unforgiveness number two is through unconfessed sin and number one is through unrighteous agreements dig into the story of joshua to understand what I mean by unrighteous agreements or covenants and how the most high honors them. And all of it's rooted in the enemy getting a foothold in your life. So you're like, okay, Natalie, I've heard the bad news. Where's the good news? Where's the uplifting and the encouraging news? Yay, let's get to it. <laughs> it's James chapter four. And if you follow me for any length of time, you know that James chapter four, is one of my favorite passages that I use thousands of times during the day, that I pray thousands of times during the day because I know that it gives me the victory that I need in overcoming my enemy. It gives me the victory that I need to kick the enemy out so that he doesn't have a foothold in my life and it doesn't become a stronghold because I'm kicking him out. So it's James chapter four. I call it the James 4, 7 formula. And I'm going to actually read James 4, 7 through 8. It says, submit yourselves to, submit yourselves then to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double minded. Okay. It's a lot in that passage. And when I say it's powerful, 
it is a powerful weapon to kick the enemy out of your lives. And it's very simple. It says submit to God. So submit yourself to the Father. Submit yourself to your Lord and Savior. Follow the lifestyle of Yahshua. Do what he did. Obey the, the commandments. Obey the scriptures. Live your life based on the scriptures. Die to self. Deny your flesh. All of this is how you submit yourself to God. And that's the first part of the scriptures. And I talk about owning your morning. Get into the scriptures, pray, confess your sin, rinse and repeat. That's how you submit. And then you resist the enemy. See, when you submit to God, when you submit to his scriptures, when you submit and yield to the Holy Spirit, when you submit and follow Yahusha, Yahshua, two ways to say Jesus in Hebrew, you will by default resist the enemy because you can't submit and give in to the enemy at the same time. It's one or the other. So as you become intentional and submit to the most high, you are resisting the enemy. And when you resist him, he flees. If you don't resist him, you are then letting him open the door. So it's not just a foothold, like an inch into your life. You are now letting him open the door. And you're like, here I am. And he comes in where he's invited. you got to understand that. But when you resist him, he has no power over you. He has no power over you. We are so destroyed because we think he does. But Yahshua died for you to be victorious over the enemy. The enemy has no place in your life that you don't give him. But if you are not dealing with the sin in your life, if you're not dealing with unforgiveness, if you don't recognize these unrighteous covenants, then the enemy has every right to be in your life. And he has every right to kill, steal, and destroy your destiny because you've let him in. But when you submit to the most high and you resist the enemy, that's when you take your power back. And that's when you become victorious. And it says that when you resist the enemy, he will flee from you. So all of those other issues will go away because you're resisting him. You're not letting him in. And then verse eight says, come near to God. And some verses say, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. And when he draw nears to you, that means he fights your battle. When he draw nears to you, that means he gives you the spirit to resist the enemy and to not be in bondage to sin. When you draw near to him and he draw nears to you, his word becomes a lamp into your feet and a light into your path. He says that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I am for you. Who can be against you? Not the enemy because I've conquered him. I've destroyed him. He is not my enemy. Understand he is our enemy, but he is not the most high's enemy because he is not the most high's equal. And so we have to draw near to the father. And he will draw near to us. And then we have to wash our hands. It says, wash your hands, oh, you sinners. In other words, turn away from your sin. Let go and kick the enemy out of your life. Y'all, this is a powerful lesson for you to take and apply to your life. I've given you the illustration of a foothold. I've given you the top three ways that the enemy has a foothold in your life. And now I've given you the solution when you're ready to kick him out. Because see, he only stays because you let him stay. He only causes you to be defeated because you allow yourself to be defeated. And I, that's straight up. That's straight up. If you continue to be defeated by the enemy, it is because you've given him a foothold in your life when Yahshua died for you to have the tools and the weapons to defeat and stump on the devil. Are you using those weapons? Are you leveraging your relationship as a daughter of the most high? Are you allowing your father to fight your battles? He's giving you the holy scriptures to defeat the enemy. Are you studying them? Are you obeying them? Are you living them? so that you can be victorious. That's it for now. I think that's a lot. <laughs> it's a beautiful lesson. And my prayer is that you apply what you learn. Be blessed.